back again here in the GCN Tech Clinic to answer the problems that you submit down there in the comment section. So remember, if you've got yourself a bike problem, make sure I know about it so I can try and tackle it and get you riding as soon as possible again. But let's crack on with the first question this week that comes in from Gavel Y who says, John, I have an Argon 18 Gallium Pro road bike with a carbon setback seat post. Do I know if it's possible to rotate the seat post 180 degrees so that the setback is forwards instead of backwards, so that with the addition of clip-on area bars, it could effectively make a TT or triathlon bike? Or would it put too much force in places it isn't supposed to be? Right then, Gavel, without knowing the exact seat post you've got fitted in there, I can't actually comment on the strength of it and the suitability of it, especially when creeping further forward over the bottom bracket. However, good news for you, my friend, is there is in fact a solution out there for you. So a company called Profile Design, who were one of the first companies who were actually making aftermarket products for triathletes and time trial riders when it became super popular around the late 80s and early 90s, they actually make a fast forward carbon seat post and that enables you to get nicely forward over the bottom bracket. I think it's got up to about 40 millimeters of adjustment, which is certainly gonna do enough for you, I reckon. So go ahead, check that one out. The Profile Design Fast Forward Carbon Seat Post. And the next question we've got comes in from Asgar, who asks, can they get their 11 speed Ultegra Di2 rear derailleur to work with a 10 speed cassette? So can they reprogram it with the eTube software? Good to hear from you, my friend. Right, so the DI2 rear derailleur, absolutely wonderful bit of kit. However, it is limited to how many sprockets it can control and work across just like a standard derailleur is because the brain of it is in fact inside of the rear derailleur, so it's not inside of the junction box or the levers or anything like that. So unfortunately, you are stuck with it to be working with an 11 speaker set which, to be honest with you, kind of saddens me in this day and age that with the electronic circuit boards inside, I'm sure, in fact, I'm positive that if Shimano really wanted us to, they would allow us to actually be able to change that around. But in doing so, it means they wouldn't sell any 11-speed DI2 rear derailleurs if you were currently using a 10-speed, if you could just reprogram it. Well, and vice versa as well there. But yeah, the answer to your question is, 11-speed DI2 is 11-speed DI2. 10-speed DI2 is 10-speed DI2. Next up is Philippe Renault. I love that surname, Renault. Right, uh, hi John, are tubular tires actually viable for day-to-day -day use or are they something just for the pros? Uh, what happens in case of a puncture? Can they be patched on the roadside? Only Philippe, he spotted a pair of deep section lightweight tubular wheels for a bargain, but wondered if they would suit the amateur rides. Right, I absolutely love this. And I love the fact you're looking out for a bargain. Now, something to consider with tubular tires is they are a bit more of a hassle to actually set up, as in you have to glue the rim as well as the tire multiple times really, just to make sure that the adhesion is really nice and secure. And at the side of the road, well, they're, I guess, less likely to puncture, pinch punctures definitely, because you don't have that inner tube inside of the rim instead of mounted inside of the tire, but, what you've got to consider here is if you do puncture, you are going to actually have to refit the whole tire on there. So in that case, you are actually going to have to take with you a spare tubular, which isn't necessarily the most convenient thing to do. Also consider you could get a little canister, which in fact, if you get a blowout or a slow puncture, for instance, you could in fact hold that onto the valve and that canister with the force of the air inside of it, as well as some sealant goes inside and it seals up the holes. But what if that wasn't to work? Well, you're left lumbered there, aren't you? I guess it's the same with an inner tube. You know, if you only have one canister with you and it doesn't work, you're in the same situation. But I like to think that for an everyday ride, a clincher tire is a lot more convenient than a tubular tire. But yeah, bargain's a bargain. It's a real tough one for that. If anyone's got any ideas for Philippe, let him know down there. Personally, I wouldn't go for it for everyday use. Next up is Stephen Freifer, who says they recently upgraded their 6800 mechanical shifting to DI2 R8050 shifters and derailleurs. They left the old crank and could sit on there to save themselves some money. They have a habit of shifting to the small chain ring when slowing to a stop. But now, if the cadence is less than 60 revs per minute, the chain drops onto the bottom bracket and they're using the semi-synchro mode, if that makes any difference. Right then. Personally, I can't think it's anything to do with your cadence that's actually affecting this. Possibly you're going from the big chain ring 
and the larger sprocket at the rear. And that angle where you're coming across is too steep, basically. And that when you press in that shifter, it's kind of throwing the chain over too far at one moment. Something to consider. Also, just actually have a look at the Duralio adjustment screws, make sure that they're set up nice and correctly. That's the only things I can really think of there that could be causing it. Uh, it shouldn't be anything to do with chain line or such because generally those things are pretty much close enough for most frames and chain sets out there. Something though you could well buy is in fact a chain catcher. So that clamps onto the front derailleur mount and it goes down there just inside of the inner chain ring and actually prevents the chain from over shifting in most scenarios. So that should save your bottom bracket. But yeah, I reckon it's probably your adjustment screws or maybe just that angle that you're initially changing gear in. And our next one this week comes in from Manas Deshpande who says they've got themselves a canyon which they ride on well-paved roads. Is a chain catcher necessary on the bike? Oh, sticking with chain catchers then. Well, uh, personally, I like to put a chain catcher on all of my bikes, other than of course my track bikes, uh, because I just like to have that extra reassurance of the chain not falling down on the inside of the chain set and then getting jammed up in amongst the bottom bracket and chain set. I have been out riding with people in the past and their chain has come all the way off and it's actually got so badly jammed down in between the chain set and the bottom bracket shell, we couldn't actually remove it, we couldn't get it off and they could carry on riding. Instead, someone actually had to come along and pick them up. That was in the days of old square taper bottom brackets where, well, you had to have a pretty special tool to remove them. These days, of course, that happens. In a lot of cases, you could probably get it out. Of course, with Shimano chain sets, you do have that funny uh, eight-sided tool, which does, in fact, remove the crank on the left-hand side. But yeah, chain catchers, as a little peace of mind, Go for one. Next one is Kick Batoski, who says, Hi John, love the show. I have a problem with my rear derailleur. When I shift into the lowest cog at the back using a normal cadence, it doesn't work. But when my RPM is above 100, it works. What the hell is it? Right then. Uh, I hope it's not anything to do with your cadence, but it could well be that when you're riding along at that 100 RPM or so, you're actually putting a little bit more pressure in, and in turn, it's actually just giving the rear derailleur just that little bit of extra flex to move into that sprocket. However, that's not good, is it? Because we want those gears to work during all different RPMs. So I'll take a look at the rear derailleur adjustment screws and importantly, do it with your rear wheel tightened up as you would have it when you're riding along normally. A lot of people, when they work on bikes in work stands, they don't do up the rear wheel tight enough. And then when they take it out of the stand, they do up the skewer a little bit more, and in turn, it actually moves that rear derailleur over because the hanger just tends to flex a little bit. Also, whilst you're looking at that hanger, make sure it's nice and straight too, and not bent one way or the other, because that could be playing havoc with your gears. But anyway, take a look at those options, and hopefully you're gonna get smooth changing gears. Yes sir, Jamie is next up. Uh, yes sir wants to know, can they use paint thinner as degreaser for their chain? Right, I'm gonna get an absolute grief in the comments for this one. Uh, now it's not exactly great for your health, your skin or the environment necessarily, but it can in fact work wonders on your chain and cassette. I'm going to leave it just there because if you do use it, you have to take extreme caution because it's, like I say, it's not good for you at all. And also make sure you rinse it really well and away from any water streams or any environmental impacts, anything like that. And we're going to leave it on that one before you lot really do go to town on me. Right, Bob a Job is up next. Uh, Bob a Job wants to know, when you bring your best bike out of winter storage, does it need a degrease to get rid of dust, etc.? if it was put away cleaned and lubed? Right then, Bob, personally, I would, because quite often that lube can actually become quite sticky and in turn actually accumulate a lot of dust and grime from just around your house. Especially if it's anything like mine. Mine gets a little bit dusty because I don't like to use the hoover that much. Uh, so give it a good clean, degrease, and then re-lubricate and everything like that. But you did the right thing to put it away at the start of winter, uh, lubricated, so it's not gonna go rusty or anything like that. It's just a shame that, well, here we're just entering winter and not exiting. Right, next one is from O Fucking L. Some of these usernames, honestly. Naughty. Right, hi John. How do I go about removing or loosening a stuck crank? I've heard about people using a hammer to bashing it off, but I'm not so sure about going down that route as my frame is carbon. Thanks. Right then, is this an old square taper uh, crank that you're talking about there that's stuck on? Because that would be the only type, really, I could imagine that would be well, stuck in place because you'd have to round off either a really big bolt if it was a Campagnolo or a SRAM one, 
or alternatively, two if it was a Shimano. So I'm not sure what you've got going there. Anyway, right, let's talk about how to get that crank off then. First off, use something called Plus Gas, which is a releasing spray. So you spray it on and it kind of breaks the seal that you could have between two components. And then you are gonna essentially have to sacrifice that crank arm because, yep, you are gonna have to be bashing it off. So you wanna have the frame held nice and securely, not in a work stand though. Really, you want someone to be bracing it from the side. So nice and rigid, but enough to kind of move because obviously you're gonna be putting a lot of force when you're trying to whack that crank off. Like I say, you are probably gonna lose the crank because you're gonna be smashing it to bits, although it won't snap in half, very unlikely. So yeah, essentially you're gonna just keep hitting it and hitting it and hitting it until it pops off. It will take quite a long time. I've had to do it a few times to people's bikes in the past where they've actually cross-threaded uh, the threads on the inside of the uh, crank where it attaches onto the axle of the bottom bracket and by using one of those old crank pullers, I don't know what they did, they just mashed up the threads. But yeah, you are gonna have to bash that, but just brace, get someone else to brace it, get them to do the kind of donkey work for you, if you like, and you get to flex your muscles and bang it off. And the final question this week comes in from Noah Yu, who says, hi John, great show, keep up the good work. Thank you very much. Uh, I've recently spotted a crack on my carbon drop bars, so I replaced them immediately. However, what can they do with them? They're reluctant to throw them away. Can I think of any other uses? The best ideas so far are wall hooks or maybe attached to the handlebars of their lawnmower. I'm actually stumped for this one. Uh, maybe make it into a little bit of wall art, candlestick holder, I don't know. In fact, let's put this one out to the viewers. Who can help Noah with a use for those broken carbon fiber handlebars? Let them know down there in the comment section below. And tell you what, Noah, send it in to us on the GCN Tech Show for the screw riding upgrades by upgrades, or something like that anyway. We just wanna see it, really. What have you done with those old carbon fiber handlebars? I do hope that this week I've been able to answer your question. And as ever, if you've got a problem, leave it for me down there in the comment section and I will do my best to help answer it. Now, what about this? Pretty cool, I must say. This is only available for a very limited edition and limited period too. Just up until, in fact, the 28th of November, we've got some Black Friday specials for you, including cycling clothing too, as well as a big old up to 50% off sale. So head on over to shop.globalcyclingnetwork.com so you don't get disappointed. And importantly, you don't miss out. Now, remember as well to like and share this video with your friends. Big old thumbs up, share it with them, go on. Go on, share it, I told you. And now for another great video. How about clicking just down here?